The Monster Guys Podcast begins now. You are over here making sheep noises. I don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> what the heck? It's been a long night. It's been a very long night. It's almost 1 o'clock in the morning, and here we are. Again. Again, at mm-hmm. 1 o'clock in the morning, recording another episode. Is, is there really, though, for what we're talking about, is there any other time that we really can record? I don't think so. I I, uh, I think 1 o'clock is our witching hour. I think that's the hour we, I don't know, we go stand in the moonlight and put on our cloaks and talk about monsters or something like that. Sacrifice <clears throat> chickens or something? Yeah. I don't know. So I, I've got this racquetball in my hand. I've been throwing up against the wall tonight. And, and losing it. Losing it. <laughs> and single bounces. That's not... But I have a racquetball and I'm not afraid to use it. So we got some stuff to talk about. You want to talk about werewolves and shapeshifters. I am chomping at the bit to talk about it tonight. Is that another pun? Chomping? At the bit. Only if we talk about horse shapeshifters. Okay. Well, whatever. Almost one o'clock in the morning. Why the I've said that. Have I said that? Um, I've said that. A few times. Yeah, well, I gotta be up early. I'm freaking tired. But I'm here for the fans. I'm here. I'm here for you, random citizen. <laughs> that is who we are always. Thinking. I'm here for you. <laughs> you wonderful fan. <laughs> I love you. That's why I do this when I'm so stinking tired. It's I think been, they feel the love. It's been such a day of minutia for me. And, and, I mean, necessary <laughs> stuff, but it is. But it's hard to say when you're not drunk. When you're not drunk. I don't when think I'm I've ever not... heard a drunk person say minutia. When, well, let's remedy that. <laughs> well, okay, you want to talk about werewolves. Before we get into that, before we get into that, we're going to go straight into Tales of the Unknown. Tales of the Unknown. And now it's time for Tales, Tales of the Tales Unknown. Of the Unknown. Tales of the Unknown. And so what I want to talk about during Tales of the Unknown is this idiotic story that I've seen coming across the news feed several times this week about a teacher calling a five-year-old evil and sinister because they're left-handed. Have you heard about this? Yeah, I've seen that one floating around. Pissed me off. It's crazy because, I mean, that's a... That's an old superstition from, you know, Dark Ages. Yeah, what the hell? Are we in the Dark Ages again? Teach? Come on. I think quotes from the letter, because it it was a big hullabaloo. I think the kid was writing with his right hand at home, and the mom, who was also left-handed, noticed it. And she asked, you know, why he was doing it, and um, he held up his left hand, and he said, my teacher said this is a bad hand. And uh, it kind of freaked her out a little bit. I, I don't know the whole story. I just know the allegations. I think that to even be having this conversation in this day, and age is ridiculous. Yeah, definitely. Well, and they have it in writing. Like, the teacher wrote a note back saying that being left-handed is associated with being unlucky and the devil and sinister, and it's just kind of crazy. I mean, what is wrong with an adult who wants to look at a five-year-old and call them evil and sinister because they're left-handed? I have no good answer for that. (laughs) I I didn't think so. I don't think anybody has a good answer for that. I just think I don't know. What what should happen to this teacher? I mean, this if this is real, if this is true, and what I've read is that she has received or is to receive some disciplinary action. I don't even know what that means anymore. Does she get detention? Does she get a moldy cookie? <laughs> what what happens to this teacher at this point? Does I think she get a bad apple if you're a bad teacher? I don't know. Yeah, maybe the whole apple and the worm thing, and maybe the apple sits on the edge of her desk for the remainder of the year, and the worm eats away at the apple, representing the deplorable mindset that you have to call a five-year-old sinister and evil because you have a, you're have you left-handed. You, you just gave, okay, this is a complete rabbit trail, but you gave me an idea. What if we had something called, the, like, the Bad Apple Awards? I could go for that. Okay. Who are we going to give a Bad Apple Award to? Uh, for starters, this teacher. Yeah, if I mean, this is real, if this is for, oh my gosh. Okay. This fine. upsets me. That, that, that's my rabbit trail. That's my contribution for tonight. Okay, well, we're going to give a Bad Apple Award to any adult any freaking adult who wants to call a five-year-old evil and sinister because of the hand they used to write with. Come on, Tales of the Unknown. 
That's what this is about, ladies and gentlemen. We're back in the dark ages. We might as well be talking about Nessie at this point. Uh, and it's and it's interesting. I don't know if you want to segue into it now, but it's. I guess we can pull up the whole left-handed thing later. But it's actually um, relevant to what we're talking about tonight too. All right. Well, let let me fade out this amazing background music for Tales of the Unknown, and then we can go into your segue. All right, so left-handedness plays a part in werewolf mythology. Yeah, let's okay. So let's take it from the top, shall we? Let's what, what take you, it from the uh, top. What is the top in werewolf mythology? Okay, so uh, look, what do you know about werewolves? What what is your common idea of a werewolf? Well, my common idea is not the common idea. So I'll tell you what the common idea. That's the better question. Okay, yeah. the common idea for werewolves, as most people who watch American movies and American American TV <laughs> definitely that trend thinks nowadays. that you become a werewolf by being bitten. Correct. And there's all kinds of other things associated with this, uh, what I would consider a Western thinking, a Western mythology about werewolves. You, you, you get bitten, you become a werewolf, you grow hair, big nose, and a lot of muscles at the full moon. Uh, you have no control over your body. You go on rampage just destroying everything and everybody in your path. Yeah, can't You're all about your... the blood, blah, blah, blah. That's that's kind of the common thinking, in my opinion, about werewolves. You know, that was in mythology for a little bit, but it really was like a small part. And to us, that that's everything nowadays a werewolf is. Did I mention that I have a racquetball? You did. I'm going to you throw know. the racquetball possibly at some point tonight, so just beware. I'm not responsible for gonna... what may or may not be said at this witching hour. Hour for us. Neither am I. And that being said, are you gonna are you gonna cause a racket, oh ladies and gentlemen? Gosh. We're having a ball here tonight. <laughs> oh, help me, please! Rolling he's, on. He's going with. His... <laughs> By the way, dying. <coughs> okay. You've been sick for the past week, and now you're over here hacking on me. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you turned a werewolf? No. Somebody bite you at work this week? Uh, yes. I don't want to know. <laughs> but listen, before we go any further into werewolf, something interesting is happening to us right now. We are just days away from releasing our short story dark fiction horror collection. Is it that close already? Pretty close. Last time and I checked it was like two months away. Yeah, I think in just uh, a couple days we've got a book signing here locally in in, uh, in the Tulsa area and then a couple days after that the book drops everywhere. Uh, so we're pretty excited about it. We've got some Heck really yeah. cool stories. So just, uh, just a little insert there. We've got a, a new book coming out. We'll talk about that that more uh, later or the closer we get to that but yeah that's pretty exciting for us right now yeah and I, I don't think we've got any werewolves in that that's kind of a we'll have to fix that in later stories down the road yeah maybe <laughs> so the the whole concept of werewolves from a, a western thought very small part of the mythology yeah and so talk to us about the bigger picture here Let, let's get a better idea of the werewolf mythology uh, we'll branch out from there well your, your Germanic werewolves Werewolves are where we get that idea. Your, your werewolves from Germany and your werewolves from you know, what is now England. That part of the world. An American werewolf in London. Exactly. That and wraps it up real nice right there. Yeah, that's it exactly. I mean, those those guys like to go eat babies, dig up dead bodies, and eat those as well. And sometimes those were created by being bitten. But that's just a small part of those even. Really, most of the time, you were either a werewolf by birth or you were a werewolf because you wanted to be. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's go back to the left handed. Let's yeah. not because I'm going to throw the freaking racquetball well, at somebody don't, for don't throw it at me and I'll be okay. calling a kid <laughs> evil and sinister. Well, and that's, I mean, what five year old is sinister? Come on. Well, back then in the dark times, we're not in the dark times. We're <laughs> in the light times. Back then, they believed. Is that what you call it? The light times? I don't think so. Well, what would you call it? Modern. We're not in the times when adults should be calling kids 21st century. Uh. Are we in the 21st century? I, I don't know that. with all the stuff going on. You know what? I don't get into politics. We don't talk politics. We don't talk all that stuff most of the time. Most of the time. But come on. <laughs> what are we? I think DC The modern age? The 21st century? <laughs> and we're talking about five-year-olds being evil and sinister? Okay. Back then, if you were born left-handed, there's a chance that you were a werewolf or a vampire. 
vampire or a witch. Or, on the flip side, you could have been a healer or a prophet or a seer of some sort. Now, I'll, t- I'll talk. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to talk about this more probably in a, in a future episode, especially where it concerns witches and the witch hunt and all that kind of stuff. You didn't even have to be born left-handed. You could just get out of bed on the wrong side. <laughs> you true. could have a garden, which who in those days did not have a garden. You could go out the wrong door at the wrong hour with the wrong person walking down the wrong side of the street. They made up anything to accuse people of being witches and werewolves and vampires and evil and sinister. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to be anything. You just had to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and needed to be somebody's excuse. To summon a Varkalok, which is another type of, like, vampire werewolf. A Varkalok. Which, uh, fans of the Monster Guy should know the What a Varkalok is. Yeah, if you've read our books, um, the Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Or you've been to any of our panels where we talk about the Varkalok. Yeah, I mean, you could be... We even teach you how to summon a Varkalok. (laughs) Exactly. It's quite humorous. Do you like that I keep interrupting you? Go ahead. Okay. If you... I expected that. If you uh, if you so much as sweep the dust and the dirt out of your house during sunset, this is very specific. If you sweep the stuff out of your house at sunset and your door happens if to you face, sweep, you just said if you sweep the stuff out of your house, you just sweep the couch right out the <laughs> freaking west facing door. That is so specific, though. It's just like you have to sweep at if this you're time cleaning, of day. If you're sweeping, yeah, yeah. and it's got to be this time of day, and your door has to face west. You could summon a barkalock, and you might be a witch. I mean, where did they come up with that? Anyways, that's a rabbit trail for another time. So anyways, you could be born left-handed, you could be born seventh son of the seventh son, you could be born with a call over your head or a tail or any number of strange circumstances born with an extra finger and you might be a werewolf or, you know, if you practice Or you could be a five-year-old in a 21st century elementary school, apparently, in the heart of the United States of America, and you could be a werewolf, evil and sinister, and sent home to your mother. Yeah, but I mean, the, the point is, not every uh, the whole biting thing was very rare. You really, except in Germany, it. you mentioned that already, yeah, I think. I think that's where you get it, that's where you get that idea from. But they also believe that you could be born this way, or if you were a practicing, you know, so are witch. you saying that the German people are the most aggressive? Is that what you're saying? Is no. the Ger- German people are aggressive people? I think in relation to our topic tonight, we'll get to those later. Those are called the berserkers. Okay. I've lived in Germany, you know. You were born in Germany. Yeah. They're some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. So but with don't scary, you go over there uh, calling German people <laughs> aggressive and they're the ones biting everybody's head off. Because that's not true. Scary language if you don't know it. <laughs> It's a beautiful language. It's beautiful. I like it. But yeah, you could also try, I love to, become, Germans. try to become a werewolf. You're by... ignoring my interruptions now. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> You could try to become a werewolf by... By magic. Basically, you, you take a bear... You take, like, a wolf skin pelt, and you tie it together to make a belt, and you make yourself a werewolf. So, this... the idea So, it's of, a costume. Basically, yeah. You dress up like a werewolf, and, and you therefore it. you are. Mm-hmm. Or you could find a, the rain inside a wolf's paw print and drink from it. And Sounds a, a little... Unsanitary? I was going to say religious or zealous. Oh, definitely. You just put on a costume, and there you go. Yeah. What happens to all those kids at Halloween every year? Well, isn't that what happens in Halloween? Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's uh, that's your your typical European werewolf for you. And we see them still today as these uh, very aggressive beasts that go out and eat people. um, When, more specifically, they they went after babies and dead bodies. But that's just a small fraction of, you know... And of course, going after babies is not aggressive at all. Well, it's aggressive, but it's a very particular... You know, they didn't go, you know, eating everybody in sight like... They didn't go ravage and tie villages and, and communities. Yeah, like that one um, Wes Craven movie. Oh my gosh, curse. yes. The one where the werewolf flicks off the cops. Yeah. That was an interesting movie. I think that's what I'd say if some teacher came to me and been like, you're left-handed and that means you're evil and sinister. And I'd say, well, watch what my right hand can do. <laughs> and what you can see, ladies and gentlemen, is that my middle finger of my right hand slowly raises. Are we going to have to censor that out? In the I don't know. I don't think they can see it. I don't think they can see it when they're listening to Avert us. your ears, listener. He's being oh. indecent. I'm kind of ticked off about the whole thing. But, okay, Western werewolf mythology, we, we've got the biting, we've got the ravaging of villages and bloodthirst and, and, 
everything, and, and that's not the big picture. So no, I, I, where do we go from here, kind of rounding out the picture of werewolves? Well, there's a whole section of werewolves that are actually benevolent, and we'll get to those in a second. I, I do want to stop and say, before we get to some of those nice werewolves, if you will, you do have the idea of, you know, vicious creatures, vicious shapeshifters all over the world. You have, like, the, the Filipino Aswang, who becomes a wolf or a bat or even a pig. Um, that can have... be a terrifying creature, the Filipino Aswang. Any of those Filipino, we, we, we'll, we'll talk about some more of them. We've talked about them in the past, but I, there's some there's some scary beasts. Some of the weirdest, most disturbing monsters that I've ever researched come from the Philippines and come from Indonesia. They are all really messed up creatures. And having a little bit of Filipino in our bloodline, that, that gets interesting. Yeah, really interesting. You also have your Native American legends of like the Skinwalker and the Wend- Wendigo, Wendigo, however you want to say it. And those have, sometimes they're not werewolves, but those have your your typical werewolf idea. And they, they are pretty vicious. They'll go after anybody and eat human flesh all day long. You know, a lot of people don't recognize that there are these wolf creatures that are protective. I think one of your favorite monsters is from Ireland, the yep. Faola. The Faola. I love them. I mean, epic, legendary epicness of creatures. Like a werewolf uh, unicorn, maybe? I don't know. No. <laughs> no, the Faola, the great protectors of the old country. That's what I like to call them, at least. There, there's a lot more to them, and, you know, it's even been said that the war goddess Morrigan, uh, that was one of her shape-shifting presences, I guess you'd say, but the Faola of Ireland. Wonderful, wonderful beast. There's an old story about a priest, or not a priest, I'm sorry, one of the saints that actually cursed a group of men that were kind of laughing at his sermon and turned them into werewolves, but if you go back into history, it's actually the, the story of the Faola and the Cognac to go much farther back than that. They've always been wolves that will guide travelers and lost children and um, women along kind of lonely roads at night to make sure that they get to their destination safely and aren't attacked by any bandits or anything like that or other wild animals. And these guys were even hired out as bodyguards during times of war Mm -hmm. to protect Irish villages. And I find that fascinating that these monsters, you know, they're they're nice for all intents and purposes, but they're still monsters and they're being hired out. Pretty awesome. And one of the things I was talking about earlier is that a wolf is just one of the many forms of the war goddess, the Morrigan. Uh, even described, she's even described as the shape-shifting goddess. And uh, here's something that was written about the Faola, uh, that these were fearsome warriors who, howling like wolves, fought for the ancient kings of Ireland and were every bit as fierce and ferocious as the beasts they assumed the shape of. These were fascinating animals, fascinating creatures, beautiful mythology surrounding these great beasts of the old country. I, I love them. Interesting. And enough, they were the good guys, in yeah. my opinion. No, definitely. They they were seen as heroes of that culture, which is pretty awesome because it, it matches up with, you know, the Yama Inu, the Japanese escort wolf, who can kind of do the same thing. You know, those lonely mountain roads where a lot of monsters, you know, if you've been to a monster guy's panel at any of the conventions we go to, we joke a lot about lonely Japanese roads. The lonely like, roads winding through <laughs> the mountains in Japan. It seems like every monster appears in Japan at night on lonely roads when you're alone. And so we always say, don't go to Japan by yourself and certainly don't go for a walk in the mountains. Don't take that lonely road walk at night if you're in Japan. Yeah. Take somebody with you or stay in the street lights. Definitely. But um, there is one monster called the Yana Inu who, like I said, he is the escort wolf. Again, he goes for okay. the the elderly or the sick or the wounded or the women and children to protect them through those lonely passes and make sure that they get home safe. Yeah, so, and again, what we're doing here, just to remind the listener, is we're, we're giving you a, a bigger, a grander picture of the werewolf mythology. It's not just limited to the ones that are bitten and that are hungry all the time and bloodthirsty and change at the full moon and have no control over themselves. You're getting you're getting a bigger picture, uh, a worldwide, a global scope of the werewolf. And I mean, we've just taken you through Ireland for a couple minutes and now into Japan. 
So there's much more to the werewolf mythology than just what we see in a few movies or TV shows. Yeah, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's universal. And, you know, it, it seems to, you know, every culture has a werewolf. Mm-hmm. But I would say it, it even branches out away from werewolves to other animals. Like in Africa, you have the, the jackal-headed men who acted as mercenaries. And they were violent, yes, but they were intelligent. They weren't mindless beasts. Yep. Um, they would attack in very specific ways, and they would single out their targets very efficiently. And taking it back to, uh, you know, you talked about how the Feola were um, these magnificent warriors that fought just as ferociously as their animal counterparts. That is interesting to me because it reminds me of um, something that we've talked about again at conventions called the uh, the Berserkers. A lot of people know what Berserkers are. I, I'm not sure that everybody would associate that with part of the werewolf mythology, but in fact it is. It's, it's just a different branch of that story. Yeah, again, um, like I said, I think it applies to shapeshifters in general. And a lot of people know berserkers as being, you know, the guys who go out and fight until they drop dead because they're just that battle frenzy. Yeah, they're crazy. They're they're insane. These guys scared Vikings. That tells you anything. Yeah. I described them as... Well, they were naked, too. Yeah. That was scary enough as itself. (laughs) They were naked and they were wearing a rug, basically. (laughs) I mean, wearing the pelt of an animal and, and running around and laughing and well it's interesting to me they weren't just naked they would cover themselves in mud and then they would wear their pelts so these guys effectively and the reason they covered themselves in mud so it was that they could blend in with the night because they attacked at night typically and then they would go and raid viking villages who the heck goes and thinks you know i need to go raid a viking village this is a great idea these guys were effectively well apparently berserkers do they were crazy yeah completely insane off center all the way these guys were effectively ninja vikings ninja did you just say ninja vikings i did how badass is that you just said ninja vikings yes that that's what they were naked wolf pelt wearing Bear pelt wearing. Bear pelt wearing <laughs> ninja Vikings. And to take it a step further, they became bears when they fought. You you know, you used this word earlier, wear bears. Well, I thought you didn't like that word. I don't like that word. <laughs> I thought you were about to say it and I was preempting you. Don't use that word because it just sounds a little I, bit I too have much. To say it once. Guys, listeners, listen to this full statement here because you just I, I, you have to have the full image. Badass, naked, ninja Viking wear bears. <sighs> There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that that pretty much sums it up. There's the truth about werewolves there you go. for you in a global scale. There you go. But yeah, these guys, again, they, they terrify bears. Vikings. Is How that where we get Care Bears from? I, I don't think that that's any relation to Care Bears. Don't say Were Bears again. Okay. I just had oh to say it Oh my once. gosh. That's <laughs> degrading. But yeah, these guys... They were These guys were own, monsters. They were their Wear own bears, um, like a cult sect. Like they, they had their whole um, culture. Ninja, yes. Wear bears. Have you you've seen the Thirteenth Warrior? And in fact, I think you showed me the Thirteenth. Of course, I've seen the Thirteenth Warrior, and they never said ninja wear bears. No, they didn't. Sounds like something somebody put on a freaking T-shirt. I don't think that would fit that movie if they said ninja wear bears. I'd be the Thirteenth Warrior had some berserkers in there. Yeah, and they, it shows them worshiping like the fertility goddess and everything and that's that's pretty mostly historically accurate they had their own religious sect within the berserker community you had an elite group that only wore wolf pelts and these guys were the ulfian not these were the badasses in my opinion yeah i mean the other guys they're crazy Mm -hmm. and they were not to be reckoned with but i think they were a little bit on the insane side well definitely because you know they again they fought to the point that if they were mortally wounded they wouldn't stop fighting fighting until they were dead until they were gone yeah but i mean i i think even in that they didn't fight with a whole lot of intelligence it was more rage well yeah that's where we get the word berserker rage um they would you know when they became when they went into their berserker rage they would actually attack foe as well as friend so if you're in within reach of them and you're on their side or your foe it doesn't matter they're just going to kill it almost reminds me a little bit, and of course this is not direct translation or a direct definition by any means, but, you know, when, when you look at, like, the new Mad Max movie, and, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. and you see those guys going out, I mean, suicidal, they didn't care, all shiny and chrome. and <laughs> You will rise shiny and chrome. <laughs> you know, and, and so that's the same mentality, that they were just going out, and was, nothing was going to stop them, friend was, or foe, no boundaries, they were going to fight to the 
the death. I think now that you say that, I, I didn't think about that earlier. But I mean, there's a definite influence there because they talk about in that movie they talk about you know rising, you know, uh, mm-hmm. driving to Valhalla. Yep. So that that does fit pretty darn well. But you know, they fought so ferociously that in legend they were said to become like in battle they would become a bear themselves, and the Ulfidnar, the elite, would actually become wolves. Um, and and this spawned a lot of the mythology. This spawned a lot of stories, a lot of legends and folk tales and uh, a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it became very real to people when they would see this taking place. And something that's kind of buried underneath that fear, just like the Feola, the Ulfinar would actually be hired out as bodyguards. Being those elite creatures that they were, you know, the Viking chiefs would go and find these guys and they would actually hire them to protect their villages and protect them themselves. Yeah, so, I mean, going back to the Ulfinar, these guys were the elite. I think we were talking earlier, even their weaponry and, and their mechanisms and everything mm-hmm. were very different than the Berserkers. Well, the Berserker would use, you know, your crude weapons like axes and clubs and um, you know, your typical swords. Uh, Ulfinar would give in um, or would use spears. They're depicted as holding spears typically, which is interesting because throughout a lot of different cultures, the spear was, you know, the symbol of the, the elite warrior and the leader. Yeah, so, I mean, ferocious, savage, but highly intelligent and on a specific mission. I, I would call that versus the Berserkers, I would call them a little bit more of a ninja <laughs> warrior mindset. Yeah, I, I, you raise a good point there. I just, I think it's fun to say ninja Vikings. Yeah, ninja Vikings, that's kind of fun to say. I, I don't know if it's proper to say that, but I'll let you have it. You can have it. Listen, <laughs> I you know, whatever 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 proper whatever just as long as you don't call kids evil and sinister because they're left-handed because they're left-handed I mean next thing you know I, I mean, mean we're gonna be hanging people again because they planted the garden on the wrong side of the freaking house to be fair you do have the children of the corn but it's not because they're left-handed yeah that's true yeah but even so come on you know elementary five-year-old okay got a rack of ball and I'm not afraid to use it All right. where else are you taking us on the on the werewolf mythology because I I think it's important that we don't just limit these creatures to uh, a Western movie, Hollywood, TV scenario, uh, but we do need to have a, a broader vision of what they're all about because they're they're fearsome. They're they are destructive in a, in a lot of cultures. They're dangerous. They're to be feared, but they're also to be revered. I think in in a lot of ways, and especially your benevolent races and like the Faola and everything. I, I think there's a lot of good, and I think there's a lot of interesting things about werewolves when we get beyond TV and Hollywood. There's definitely a lot of a lot that you can say, and I think some of it I personally would like to say for a future episode when we talk about vampires. Vampires are so I mean they're always we're gonna get in a lot of trouble when we talk about vampires. Probably, yeah. I don't care though because I have a racquetball and I'm not afraid to use it as long as you don't lose that racquetball before that episode. I'll find another one. I don't care. <laughs> but see, I at least vampires... I know what a racquetball is. Do you know what a racquetball is? I do. Does your girlfriend know what a racquetball is? She does now. Uh Uh-huh. This is a shout-out to Cheyenne. Hi, Cheyenne. Cheyenne, we're going to take you to racquetball court and help you out. I hope you enjoyed the whole bear thing. I don't think I've told you Cheyenne's favorite animal is a bear. Oh, really? So this would probably hold some personal interest for her. That's cool. I like bears. We used to have a bear that would hang around our house in Florida. Do you remember that? I do. You were pretty young, but... uh, right outside my window one night. Yep. He He would come around... Quite often, we lived very close to a nature preserve. I think it was during Christmas time that it he would like pour the trash open. Yeah, absolutely. Time. He would come every year at Christmas time, make his presence known. Never dangerous, never causing any real trouble. He was just hungry and looking for something to eat. And yeah, it was a little like wasn't it just a teeny tiny one? Well, the first year he was tiny, <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> but he kept coming back, and he got bigger every year. But that's cool though. Uh, we like bears, and we give proper respect to men who run around naked wearing a bear (laughs) coat just to be sure respect is one word i would say just a safe distance is another word as well safe distance i'm (laughs) forget that i'm leaving the country but you know there is some stuff that i want to talk about more with werewolves um when we get into vampires because that that actually crosses paths a lot yeah it does quite a bit i think one thing that i would still want to say here though is that you do see werewolves in modern pop culture as being these savage beasts when really um throughout the world um your shapeshifters in general were very magical and very if i could use the word esoteric i guess they mm-hmm. yep. they studied the dark arts they studied other magical arts and they were very intelligent about what they did 
And yeah. that's true through Japan, through England. I wonder, and I'm just kind of shooting off the top of my head here, but I wonder if the whole think of them as savage beasts, bloodthirsty, always out to kill, evil, sinister, and all that kind of stuff about werewolves in our Western cultures and our Western mythology. I wonder if that has anything to do with just the, the heavy influence of Christianity in our culture and how we need to make a lot of this evil and sinister in order to point a finger or raise a cross at type of thing. I'm glad you said that because, again, where we get a lot of our common um, ideas on them, you know, the, the Germanic werewolves and the English werewolves, they were thought to be tools of the devil specifically. Enemies of the church. Yeah, hellhounds. Yeah, hellhounds at the door. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I wonder if, if that's really seeped into, you know, our thinking through our culture because of religion and it's just become a part of Hollywood and TV and not even because somebody wanted to make a crazy movie but because that mindset set so deep into our thinking over the centuries because of the influence of the church and the fact that we needed something sinister and evil to point a finger at and throw a holy water at or whatever but you know I, it's very much a western thing because you go to Japan or you go to Ireland or you go I mean Ireland's obviously you know more of a western thinking, but there's kind of an isolated group there, you know, when you're talking about the Faola, but you you go beyond that, and these are pretty fascinating and intelligent, like you said, magical creatures. They can be very dangerous. Uh, For the most part, they're doing their thing, and you know what I mean? I do. I mean, um, like I said earlier, the the Faola, once Christianity, you know, became big in Ireland, there was actually a story created to explain away Faola, and they were kind of cursed, but they were still, it was almost like a, hey, you guys are cursed but you're going to be good like they were i guess disrespectful towards this saint but he was he cursed them and they were still basically given the job to protect if we talk about the Ulthidnar, uh, we talked about how they were kind of like a religious sect. Ulthidnar were very highly, I mean, they were connected to Odin. So mm-hmm. there's almost a, a divine aspect there. Yeah. Some of your Japanese shapeshifters, not necessarily the wolves, but um, like your Kitsune, one of my favorite monsters of all time, the Japanese fox. They were actually messengers of the gods. Mm-hmm. So they, definitely that's a good point that uh, the European werewolves, they are specifically said to be of the devil, but a lot of your others are highly connected with gods and other... We, we, we seem to come to this point in the conversation quite a bit when we're talking about monsters and legends and folklore. <clears throat> I think it's very interesting over the years how this has come to be with, with a lot of creatures. You mean the, the Christianity aspect? <clears throat> yeah, the religious aspect, the Christianity aspect, but it's not always just Christianity, but you know, religion in the West, you know, Christianity is predominantly figuring into this, of course, because of your demons and your devils, and we had to have excuses to accuse people of witchcraft and Satan worship and everything else and create frenzies and you know so yeah I mean it's it's pretty prominent in the West from the standpoint of Christianity but that's true and you do have some um, even in the East you have during your political marches against each other some of the, the Eastern countries would do the same thing with Buddhism versus Shintoism versus you know whatever yeah. was big at that time so it's all very interesting and and uh, werewolves are a fascinating and very popular part of many cultures obviously and especially where media and entertainment are concerned, uh, especially in our side of the world. But, you know, fascinating stories, very interesting mythologies, and and it's something I think we want to go deeper into in the future. Dedicate some episodes to the fail. Dedicate some episodes to Berserkers and and Ophidnar, because there's a lot more to them. We've just kind of scratched the surface. Given a, a universal look at your shapeshifters and uh, trying to tear away the veil of Hollywood. So ladies and gentlemen, there you go. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight at our witching hour, which... Yeah, Howl at the Moon. This seems to be the the hour that we do most of our stuff, which is always exciting unless you got to be up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Which you do. Which I do, but that's okay. Like I said, it's for you, the fans. (laughs) 
and I love you. And now I'm going to throw a racquetball. Do you see us so loving? I am loving. I'm kind. Buy our books. Read our books. Give us good reviews. And we will not hire Ulfibnar to come <laughs> after you. And listen, do not, for any reason, accuse a five-year-old of being evil and sinister. I don't care what hand they use to write with. I don't care how ugly or disrespectful their kids. Just let's learn to treat kids like kids. Take care of them and protect them and not call them evil and sinister. Here, here. All right. You guys have a good night. The Monster Guys signing off. Good night. <laughs> Shut up and sit down.